everybody to Truth Attack Hour with Tyra and Tolek, where religion, politics, and the law are mentioned all in one breath. Feel free to call 410-848-9191 if you want to join the conversation. And uh, visit lwrn.net and truth-attack.com and just surf those pages and get a lot of information because every day, the more time goes by, the more we need to be informed and to be educated. All right. Uh, oh, and by the way, don't forget that if you like what you're hearing on this network, by all means, send uh, donations. We don't have advertisement, uh, but hey, I think donations even mean more than getting paid through advertisement because people really enjoy it and people really want to be a part more integrally than just listen to some advertisements. So I thank you and the stations thanks you for the donations that some of you are already sending in. So that's really great. All right. I have a bunch of stuff to share like I always do and it goes from all the way from uh a movie that I saw on Sunday to ISIS to China and the market and things that are happening and even uh, the Shemitah year that everybody seemed to be mentioning last year. Uh, so in what the updates are with that, I wanted to share with you first, and I'm going to dovetail into some of these things here, of um, a movie that that I saw. It was, it's um by Joel Richardson, and it's called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. And it has to do with um, Iraqi nationals that have converted to Christianity and how are they responding while they're there and what they need to do. And, and Joel Richardson is the kind of guy that he his mission, his and he would tell you right off the bat, his goal in life is to be a missionary to Iraq and move over there, take his entire family over there and just minister to those people in in a contrary or or to to reverse or somehow give a different view of what Americans think that Muslim and, and Iraqi people are. You know, we always uh, make a hasty generalization of a, the entire population just because several are real jerks. And we do that all the time, and that's just human nature. But obviously, that's not hardly ever the case. So, And uh, I got accused before I continue. I, I'm, a friend of mine said, hey, I thought Truth Attack Hour was supposed to be about income tax because um, um, the late Tommy Cryer, who started... I think he started Truth Attack, or at least was an integral part of it. Uh, that was all he talked about. Um, pretty much that was his mission in life, uh, to tell people about it. But that's not mine. I like, Truth Attack is much broader for me than just income tax truth. And it has to cover, like I say in the beginning of the show, tr you know, religion, politics, and the law. How they all affect each other. They are, are symbiotic. They're intertwine you can't separate them and i mentioned that um this meeting on sunday where i saw this movie that i was talking about that everything in life is spiritual even the stock market because there are spiritual things that you think about as a believer that affect how you're going to deal with it and so you have to you have to see what it is that you're going to do about it and if it's going to be something that the kingdom of God will be enhanced and and built up. But they didn't agree. They didn't they didn't think that uh everything is spiritual. I, I think everything is. And so when my husband and I were talking, we only got barely like a minute into our comment when we we got shut down immediately. And that is something that um we experience a lot because people don't want the types of things that we discuss. But um, that movie went on uh, to promote a certain book about, you know, the the coming of the Lord. Is the church ready for the coming of the Lord and this and that? And um, as I was listening, because once it got shut down, I just didn't want to contribute anything. 
I just pretty much was quiet the rest of the time. And so was my husband. He didn't say anything. And so as we were closing the meeting and, and they wanted to pray, the lady of the house who shut us down apologized to my husband for doing so. And he, you know, as everything closed down and everybody gathered around the munchie table, um, he said, you know, soon after you shut me down, the next thing was the church is asleep. And that's what I was talking about. That's what I wanted to talk about. So they focus about the romance of being a missionary in a country that could kill you. You know, there's always a romantic thing about it, you know, a, a obviously supernatural, but beyond our normal reality type of thing. And so, but they don't look at what America will suffer. Oh, we'll never be killed. Like, like you know, we'll never have this, the same type of, of um, looking over your shoulders situation or being super careful as to what you're going to say to expose yourself that you're a Christian if you are in a Muslim country. But see, it's never going to be that way because we're not a Muslim country. So the persecution that will happen here is total. will be totally different. It will be in a different uh, setting and different, for lack of a better word, execution. Um, but most Christians don't want to hear what that would entail, at least what my husband and I believe that the Lord is sharing with us about it. And yet I share share it every week. I, I talk about it every week. In fact, uh, I had a friend of mine who, with whom I used to go pray, and uh, he said, "Oh, we got to pray. Let's pray that, you know, the church will wake up. The church will wake up." And I said later, a few months later, "Hey, um, I didn't, I'm just curious. Do you have a problem with, you know, contributing to my show at twenty dollars a year?" And it came, it came to the bottom line that she didn't like what I said on the show because it affected her directly. And so she just did not want to. I said to her, look, I'm doing the very thing we've been praying about this whole year, that the church would will wake up. That's what I'm doing. Um, and it just did not sink in. And that's okay. Um, we parted ways. She, you could say, broke up with me. Uh, she didn't want me to be her friend anymore, so I said, fine, uh, we won't be. But there are more people in our lives that do that as we go along, and I don't don't really care. It It bothers me, it hurts me, it wounds me, but I don't care about it because I can't care about it. And so you start building a thick skin about that. So anyway... Um, Soon afterwards, well, let me see. When we came back home, we saw a clip on Fox News. And, you know, a lot of people here in America think they're so protected. You know, only, you know, lone wolves are out there doing things. But this clip that we saw from Fox News was was eye-opening because it was not an ISIS propaganda clip. It was actually footage, a training video of how ISIS is making um, remote-controlled cars with a mannequin that has a thermal um, control in it that would take it to body temperature so that nobody would suspect that that car is remotely controlled by a lifeless thing you know, or at least the mannequin is not driving, obviously, but the temperature of the mannequin is up to human detection or human temperature, so it won't be detected as being driven remotely with a bomb in it. Another thing that they're doing is uh, they're turning old, uh, they're recommissioning thousands of missiles that were previously thought useless, and they're and they're from ground to air missiles, and they're turning it into I'm sorry, they're missiles from air to ground, 
and they're turning them into ground-to-air missiles that they would detect heat and go after military and passenger planes. They had a hurdle in that the battery, the thermal battery, wasn't lasting long enough. Lo and behold, you know, they, they show how they made a homemade thermal battery that will last the time that it needed to go from ground to air. And uh, see, those things are not for, for an internal use for them, you know, uh, in Syria. Well, maybe they might use it, but their scope is much greater than that, much broader than that. So, sure, they can come here. So how are we going to protect ourselves from that? You know, it's, it's just going to be increasingly difficult. But there's the other, the other attack. The other one that I just mentioned with ISIS is, is general. It, it's anybody. It doesn't matter who. You know, and they won't ask you if you're a Christian when they're remotely controlling this car bomb that, that nobody is going to be a martyr in, and nobody will get the 72 virgins with it. But they're not going to stop the car and say, are you a Christian? Because I'm going to blow you up if, if you say yes. They're going to do anybody, right? But the ones that are specifically targeting Christians is none other than our, our dear government. Because our dear government does, us, does not understand, and we as believers have not stood for the degree of loyalty that God expects from us. And I can understand that that misunderstanding grew from a time when there was an understanding. And Christianity was the predominant religion here and the most respected one here. But as time, obviously, you know, 200 and some years, that respect and that protection has no longer been at the forefront other things have the culture has changed, obviously. So now they are the ones asking us, "Are you a Christian? Because if you are, you better not discriminate, and you better not be against abortion, and you better not be against this, that, and the other." I read this article from Decision Magazine, and Decision Magazine is the magazine that Billy Graham's um, Evangelistic Association puts out, and it says. Prepare for a persecution. And I read the whole thing, and I said, okay. Very general in the preparation, but the points are well taken. Make sure that you're, you're of your relationship with God. Are you, you know, did you receive the redemption that Jesus' cross offers? Yes. Walk with God. Assimilate the scriptures. Pray always and meditate on Christ. All the... All, these, like the last three, four, and five, assimilate scripture. They say, memorize it. Put it to memory because there might be one day where you won't have a Bible and you'll have it memorized. Yes, I like that. Pray always. Okay, that's general. Yes, you pray always and meditate on Christ. Yes. But the number two, walk with God. He gives an example. He says, walk with God as Moses did on the backside of the desert when the hour of judgment fell upon Egypt. I'm going to go on with this number two because I think it's important. So don't touch that webpage, don't touch that dial, stay tuned, and I will finish covering this Walk With God situation in the midst of persecution. Don't go away. For staying on with me, Truth Attack Hour four one zero eight four eight nine one nine one. 
I was talking about the five steps that Billy Graham in his magazine decision set for us to prepare for persecution, discussing uh, number two, walk with God. And the first was walk with God as Moses did in the backside of the desert when the hour of judgment fell upon Egypt. And then he says, Daniel and his three young friends walked with God in Babylon, and when their trouble came, God was beside them, whether it was in the lion's den or in the fiery furnace. But he didn't say, in, any, in none of these examples within this number two, did he say, how did they defy? How did they walk with God? Because a lot of times walking with God is going to go directly against the grain of another God or of another principality. So what are you going to do when you go against that principality? With Moses, surely he went uh, and told Mo, um, Pharaoh, hey, you got to let him go because God said he wants these people to worship him and obey him. Not you, obey them, him. And then, uh, but with Daniel, it was a little bit different because he was already in Babylon under captivity. And several times, Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, I don't want you guys praying. And what was the first thing that Daniel did? He opened the windows wide open and he made sure everybody saw him and he started praying to the God of Israel. Total defiance against the law of Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, but it's okay because it's prayer. It's a spiritual thing. It's not over there at the at the meeting. They call the difference as a national thing, and not a spiritual thing. When we were bringing up certain issues, well, guess what? Um, going against anti-discrimination law is a spiritual thing, although it's also a national thing. So here, in this setting, in this country, the persecution is not going to be you know, romantic, like it is, you know, the 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 uh, courage that these Christians over in Iraq have. Oh, but it takes a lot of courage here, too. It's kind of minimized. It's kind of like toned down that somehow there can't be a persecution to the level of what the, the Christians are experiencing in Iraq or Iran or Egypt or wherever, even Israel, for that matter. Oh, no, it will never reach that magnitude here. Well, yes, it has. It already has, and it will continue to. It's just going to take a different form. Because what we love is different than what they love. And if there is a, a if, if fear strikes to your core that makes you tremble, if you lose anything here, then your God is not the God of the Bible. It's some other God. It's the God that can take that away that you fear. Here's another example. I don't even know if I'm going to get into China. Well, that's okay because then I'll have the research done for next week. Yay. All right. This is World Magazine. And this was very interesting, too. World Magazine, Houses Taken Over. And this woman is by, uh, goes by the name of Andre Sue Peterson. And she wrote this article. And... She's talking about her church, and her church has a some kind of community service thing where they help, um, let me see, non-native English speakers in the community with whatever they're teaching them, and they offer child care. Well, it turns out that the director announced that next summer they won't, this, this coming summer this year, they won't have child care. Because of a law that says that church personnel, and that already, you know, was a red flag for me, church personnel involved with ch uh, children must receive official criminal background clearance. And so he decided not to have it at all, which then reduced the amount of people that would go to this teaching group that they are putting together. As they were discussing it, um... Nobody seemed to have, you know, been bothered by that. Except for one girl who said that it might be fun to be fin fingerprinted. That also was a big red flag for me. Okay, and so 
this whole event reminded this woman of Dr. Zhivago. And if you can get Dr. Zhivago on Netflix or rent it or buy it, or just look at it. Okay? And then draw the parallels of what's happening here. Basically, Dr. Zhivago was um, coming home from fighting on the, uh, on the front, and uh, he came to his house. He had a, you know, a big house with a bunch of beautiful rooms and stuff, and he comes to his home being occupied by 13 families, and there's somebody there that is like the director of community whatever, and his wife greets him with a smile. Oh, look, honey, look, we got all these people. And he tells everybody, hey, it's okay, everybody. He lives here. He's the one that, you know, we're, we're the ones. He's my husband. We live here. So he, they walk up to the one room designated for those two to live. And um, the, oh, my goodness gracious. Hold on a minute. Okay. It says, uh, they, the, the wife introduced him to Comrade Yelkin, our local delegate, and he lives here. Oh, how do you do? Blah, blah, blah. Welcome, welcome. La, yeah, yeah. And then there was this other woman who, whose name was Tanya, and she couldn't resist by giving him another final jab, saying, there was living space for 13 families in this one house, meaning how can you be a one percenter and have this big house all to yourself and your wife and not have it for other people too? And he says, yes, he says in a soft-spoken voice, yes, this is a better arrangement, comrades, more just, more just. It was not long ago that the state cracked down on church homemade desserts. Oh, yes, just like they cracked down on lemonade stands and probably in high school. I mean, I remember raising funds in high school, selling, you know, having a bake sale. And we would bring stuff. Some people would have uh, store-bought stuff, and some people would make stuff. Sometimes I would make stuff. And so now at the church in Pennsylvania in 2009, uh, an inspector, state inspector, shut down the uh, bake sale at the church because the items were not store-bought. So that was the end of the homemade coconut cream pie and the raisin pie and the farm apple pie that different members made. That was the end of it. Okay, well, I can understand, blah, blah, blah. All right, but... If you remember, in the 1930s, there were certain laws, okay? The law for the restoration of the professional civil service, which barred people of the Jewish descent from employment in government. Or the 1935 law for the protection of German blood and honor that interdict, interdicted marriage between Jews and German. Or the 1938 law that required that Jewish uh, people with passports have a big J stamped on it. Oh, oh, well, we acquiesce. We, you know, we're sad or, you know, blah, blah, but we acquiesce. We'll do it. And you all know the end of that story, right? So, but this is what kills me. After this, this whole thing, and I'll bring what kills me to the end. I wanna, I'm going to say a couple of things first. He says, the woman sitting to my right of that group that was teaching, okay, the meeting, said, not disapprovingly, that from now on, if a high, junior high event takes place at someone's house, a person must be present who has state clearance. I hazard at the point that it looked like government intrusion, and no one said a word as if I had passed gas and everyone pre uh, pretended I had not, as if I were the kind of person who did not care about children. First Chronicles 12.32, the tribe of Issachar is commented for being, quote, men who had understanding of the times. Before long, 
not only did they take the rooms in Dr. Zhivago's house, they took his books, they took his jewelry, he took this china, he took, they took his paintings, and they stripped them bare. But this is the one that kills me. Because they, this woman thinks that if the pastor knew everybody really, really well, they wouldn't need, you know, inspectors to be criminally or, you know, to have criminal background checks on people that would be around children. And this is what she says. There is nothing much to say except that we had better get back to the New Testament model where pastors know their flock. That's not the New Testament model. That the pastors would know their flock intimately and for decades is not going to change that law. It's not going to change it. But you know what will change it? Don't incorporate. Just, you know, if you're incorporated, you know what you do? You unincorporate and then just meet privately at home. Because the kingdom of God is for the kingdom dwellers. It's not for everybody. It's not open to the public. It's very private. So don't incorporate. So these laws won't apply to you. If you want your friend to take care of your kid, then take care. If you want to meet in a house with these people to teach them, the you know, non-native English people, teach them whatever you want to do, do it in your house. It's a private thing. But this, the mentality of this woman, although she brings something, something very, very important, the only thing she, she could think of of going back to the New Testament model is for pastors to know everybody really well. And I'm going, oh, brother, she just, she just missed a great opportunity to really come out from that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'll email her later, later and tell her all that wonderful stuff. <laughs> I don't know. It's just my opinion, folks. But, you know, if you leave digital tracks, digital crumbs, they're going to find you, right? If they want to hack you, if they want to take your Social Security number, if they want to do all that, if you leave it out there, someone could see it. So what do you do? Don't use it in that way. Nobody could see it. Oh, but we can't do that because we can't live in the society with without it. And, and you know, we're so integrally, you know, intertwined with that. It's going to come to a point where we in our setting are going to have to make the same decisions of life and death as those Christians in Muslim countries. But it's not going to be because of Islam. It's going to be other things that we are very, very familiar with. Things that have been so common in our lives that, you know, we have acclimated. Somebody could be in a room that stinks long enough and they won't smell it. That's what I look at it as. That's what it is. And so when you come in and say, okay, step out of the room long enough and go back in, you'll smell it. You'll smell it because you have come out from that. Next segment, I'm going to talk about China, Baltic's dry index, the economy, and Shemitah. So don't go away. I'll be right back. Thank you for staying with me here. Uh, I really ranted on the last two segments, but hey, when I get passionate, I do. So thank you for hearing me out. Now, the rest of the segment here, and if I don't get to finish it now, I'll finish it next week, has to do with the economy, has to do with uh, Shemitah, has to do with a lot of things that probably a lot of us don't even listen to because this kind of information you have to read you won't hear it on the news so if you don't read on the internet especially the uh, the um, websites having to do with the stock market and and those types of things you're not going to be informed the first article obviously is um, 
not current, but it is applicable. It ha it was uh, published last year, September, and remember that September was the Shemitah, all right? September 9 is this article, and it says, China leading world towards global economic recession, uh, warns Citibank. And Citibank has relations and has offices over there in China. And um, this is not, none of these articles have to do with Jonathan Kahn and his book, The Shemitah Year, and all that stuff. But it does, it does bring legitimacy. He mentioned in his book that there's sometimes in the Shemitah year, which is the year of shaking, the seven year cycle, and a lot of um, stock Wall Street people recognize a seven year cycle. Even though they're not Christians, they have no clue that it has anything to do with the Shemitah. But they recognize it because it's very um, systemic. You know, it happens every seven years. Well, Jonathan Kahn said that in the Shemitah year, sometimes the the devastation doesn't happen right at the end um, or at the beginning of the Shemitah year. It doesn't happen. But the ripple effect does carry on through several months. This is September of last year, and this is what they're saying. A hard landing for the Chinese economy will likely lead the world into recession into next year. That means this year. Okay, analysts at the Wall Street Bank believe that a slowdown concentrated in emerging markets, okay, emerging markets, that means that the, they're not strong and certain things will affect it a lot greater than here will drag down demand and see economic economic activity fall well below its potential across the world. Well, last week, uh, there was a big burp from China, and the stock market plummeted. And uh, it had to, when, when their, I think that what it is, is when their sell volume goes below 7%, seven, uh, 7 that they shut it down. They shut the, the Chinese market down, and they did that twice. And that was within the last 10 days, okay? Um, and it did affect what happened over there, did affect over here. But this is, this, is almost, this is like a prophetic thing. Next year, that means this year, these things are going to happen. And I was looking at the stock market and looking at the triple Q and – they say basically, as January goes, so does the rest of the year. We haven't had not even two weeks of this year, and already the stock market cumulatively has gone about a thousand a uh, thousand points down. That's not a good thing. Now, if it went a thousand down, uh, points down in one day, oh, everybody would know about it. But because it has been incremental, it's the 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 impact is not as obvious. Okay, so um, Willem Buter, who is the global chief economist at Citibank and a former Bank of England rate setter, says this, economists seldom call recessions, downturns, recoveries, or periods of boom unless they are staring them in the face. We believe this may be one of these times. They don't get it. Not even economists get it. It has to be blatant. It has to stare you in the face before you call it anything. China is now growing at just 4%, well below the number issued by its government statisticians and the country's official 7% growth target. Other large economies, Brazil, Russia, and South Africa, are already in trouble. Okay, so that was last year. <clears throat> Here are some some information from this year. It's time to stash the cash. And basically, it's the increasing volatility. If you look at the stock market uh, on C CNBC, CNBC, you would see it go up, 
200 points, go down 200 points. Go up 50, go down 50. It just, it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and the average is flat. It's just flat. It's not doing anything. But the up and down is going down, if you know what I mean. So they're saying basically because credit going to the banks is not going to be as uh, lucrative, they're saying you better just, you know, have some cash around because the market is just too volatile for a stability, for, for there being confidence. And, and the investors are being told to sell and keep cash around. So that's another article. Uh, oh, this is very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. This article says, nothing is moving. The Baltic dry crashes as insiders warn, quote, commerce, commerce has come to a halt. And this has to do with shipping, the shipping routes of of uh, goods for construction or for uh, steel or for lumber or these things. If you, they show a map here of where the ships are, and there's none that is going from America to Europe, and there's none that's going from America West Coast to Asia. Everybody's pretty much huddling on the shore of their respective countries. There's no movement. It says no ships at sea right now because operating them meant running at a loss. And so this index, the dry Baltic, um, the Baltic dry index, is how they determine whether going, you know, taking your ship from America to Europe is going to be profitable. And it's not happening. And this is an economic sign. If nobody is moving because it costs too much to move the stuff around, then the economy is going to shrink because those things, those materials needed are not going to be there. The Baltic Dry Index, an assessment of the price of moving major raw materials by sea, was already at all record time lows a month ago. And in the last month, it has dropped even more to 415. Well, to give you some kind of context, when this index was created, um, let me see, let me find it real quick. Okay, it was at 11,793 in 1985. Um, in 2000, let me see, uh, in 2008, it dropped. 94% to 6.63, and today it is at 415, it, and it's going further down. It is, and not only that, the car manufacturers have a, are glutted with new cars, and nobody's buying them. And now these things are happening in Europe a lot of a lot of it, but it's going to affect us. Commerce between Europe and North America has literally come to a halt for the first time in known history. Not one cargo ship is in transit in the North American, uh, in North Atlantic between Europe and North America. All of them, hundreds, are either anchored offshore or in port. That's important. But do you hear any of this in the news? No. You don't hear any of this in the news. And one thing about this dry um, uh, Baltic dry index is because dry bulk primarily consists of materials that function as raw material inputs to the production of intermediate to finished goods such as concrete, electricity, steel, and food, the index is also seen as an efficient 
economic indicator of future economic growth and production. A future, okay? So if nothing moving, they should tell. I wonder if Obama tonight in the State of the Union is going to bring this up. Hmm, I don't think so. Okay, one last thing. The Royal um, Bank of Scotland cries, sell everything as deflationary crisis nears. <clears throat> it says the RBS, that's the Royal Bank of Scotland, has advised clients to brace for a, quote, cataclysmic year, that's this year, in a global deflationary crisis, warning that major stock markets can fall by a fifth and oil may plummet to $16 a barrel. And OPEC is freaking out because they don't know what to do about it. They don't know what to do about it. And there's capital flight. If you don't know what capital flight is, Capital flight is a large-scale exodus of financial assets and capital from a nation due to events such as political or economic instability, currency devaluation, or the imposition of capital control. That's what happened in, in China. They're devaluing their currency. They are controlling capital, and it's a, it's a huge event. That means that people take their money out of the country and put it somewhere else where they feel it's more stable and more secure. That's what's happening, folks. Mr. Roberts, uh, who is uh, the bank's, uh, you know, the Royal uh, Bank of Scotland's research chief for European, uh, European economics and rates, said that global trade and loans are contracting Global debt ratios have reached record highs. He expects Wall Street and European stocks to fall by 10% to 20%, with even a deeper slide for the FTSE, which is the Financial Times Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange. Given its high weighting on energy and commodities companies, London is vulnerable to a negative shock. All these people who are long oil, and mining companies thinking that the dividends are safe are going to discover that they're not at all safe. And these are big companies. Well, guys, I don't know about you, but the Shemitah effect, the Shemitah, uh, Shemitah ripple is going to go into the summer of this year. That's what they are saying. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate your listener. And we'll talk next week. Have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.